This is Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson Podcast. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to Cosmographia, the Randall Carlson podcast. And we're joined by all the Hollywood squares. We've got Brad, we've got Mike, the normal guy, and of course, Randall. And uh, what do you guys think? Is uh, you you getting spring over there where you live? Is it spring yet? Is it it's, getting there? Uh, today was a beautiful, sunny day. Uh, yeah. Just uh, rainy yesterday, but spring is creeping up on us. All right. Yes, it is. Um. About 60 today, maybe it just hit 60. Um, but we had 68 a uh, couple of days before the rain came in, and that was nice. That yeah. gave us a foretaste of what's to come. Yep. Yeah. Another four to six weeks from now, and I'll be ready for it. The crocuses and the daffodils are blooming. The litten hey. roses are blooming. All right. Uh, saw, saw a flock of starlings the other day singing away in the tree, like let, letting us know that – they know that, that they it's know. March. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, yep. Yeah. So yeah, growing up in Minnesota, of course, this was the time of year where I was like, oh, spring, hurry up, hurry up. Cause it was not only six months of winter and being snowed in. That's like, you're also looking at the, you know, there's light at the end of the tunnel because you know, that summer vacation is on the way. Oh yeah. And summer yeah. vacation, you know what that meant? Freedom. Yes. Freedom, Freedom. for Freedom. three months. Fishing. So how long was summer in Minnesota? Uh, like two weeks? <laughs> <laughs> no, nah, man. It, we got a good, we, we had a good summer up there. It lasts at least a whole Saturday, I've heard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Typically, summer kicks in about August 23rd, and then it's over by September 2nd, right in there. <laughs> no, 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 no. Well, let's see. I mean, by June, we were swimming in the lakes. They were, they were chilly, but certainly doable you know yeah. so but march late march was the big i loved late march because that's when the snowpack melted and if you know if if i had to trace the ultimate origin of this interest in paleohydrology it was back to being a kid watching the, the snow melt and because when the snow is melting away and if you guys have never really grown up in an environment where you got six feet of snow right didn't grow That's, up, but I did live in Vermont for a year and in Wyoming for a year. So okay, so okay, so it, then yeah. you you're not completely uh, ignorant about the phenomena that's associated with the with the snow melt, right? That's and uh, the cool thing was is you had all these temporary creeks and you know rivulets and and things, and we had a lot of fun with that because we would build dams out of mud and rock and logs and stuff. And, uh, you know, yeah, maybe get cherry course. bombs and blow them up. Yes. <laughs> oh yeah. We did all that stuff. Yep. You, yeah. <laughs> so, I think, I, yeah, we, we, when we were, where we grew up, there was a Creek behind our house and we dammed it up all the time. And sometimes it would make people mad because the dams were pretty effective. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, they, we, you know, there would be, and some of these streams were pretty impressive actually and they would only last for you know a week or two because yeah. the snow is melting yeah, the, away the melt, the melt streams right yeah. melt streams yeah yeah so we would be ready and uh yeah we got some pretty elaborate infrastructure built some of those springs <laughs> 11 12 13 years old yeah, yeah we were we were on top of all that and then you know and then you knew that the countdown once you hit easter vacation then it was like the countdown and of right. course, back for us in rural Minnesota, back then in the late early sixties, late fifties, early sixties, summer vacation lasted from you got out for Memorial Day, and then you didn't go again until after Labor Day. Right. And then we used to get a week off for Thanksgiving because there was a lot of harvesting work and stuff that would be going on around Thanksgiving. So mm. um, we got a whole week off. So did you do any harvest? Well, yeah. I yeah. mean, we, we weren't farmers, so I mean, right, we didn't, but, you, but you, you the hired farmers. On? Were, yeah. 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 
That's cool. Yeah, we're yeah. actually we're um we're trimming up the grapevines right now out at the uh at the vineyard. Well, how did they fare with the uh with the uh younger Dryas event that you guys had? <laughs> yeah. yeah. We uh we're looking at about twenty percent mortality for the buds. Huh. So it's not bad. Yeah. Oh, okay. Some way, yeah. I mean some people had eighty percent bud yeah. loss on some. Ooh, no, that would yeah. be bad. Yeah. Yeah. So it's all right. It's not and it's not mortality of the plants it's the buds that will sprout in spring mm. so all okay. the grapevines already have these little tiny white uh buds all over them where you know that the new shoots will come up in spring mm -hmm. and the freeze you know dried out killed basically about 20 percent of those on our i uh, see we, we sent we sent some samples off to test and but 20 percent's not nearly as bad as we were worried it could be so good so yeah we're going through and trimming them up and they're, we're getting them ready because uh you know it's bud break is bud coming. Bud break is coming. Yeah. And then, okay, then what's the next step? Well, we have to cover them with n hail netting yep. to protect once we were done pruning. Spring hail. Uh, and that is a huge mm. job. Yeah. Mm. And then once the shoots get about 18 inches long, probably go in and do some shoot thinning, depending on if we need to. How vigorous they are. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you strategically leave so many buds. But, so since we think, well, we've got about a 20% mortality rate for the buds we're leaving extra buds just in and case. so yeah. if they if a lot of them come up we're gonna have to go in and thin them out mm -hmm. um but yeah it's and then it's just uh you know making sure they have water and waiting for the fruit to set mm -hmm. yeah and we're, we're doing a it's a you train them so that they grow up as mostly a single trunk and then it splits into a t Right, so the trunk goes mm -hmm. up and splits out into a T, and then and then each the lengths of the T, what are it, like two feet, two and a half? Yeah, they're five foot spacing. So yeah, two and a half. So feet five foot total side. for the top of the T, and then all the buds grow up from that, and so the fruit all ends up right there in this sort of you know it's a like when you're standing next to the trellis, the fruit is all right here at chest level, basically mm. stomach and chest level. Um, yeah, it's a fun, it's fun. It's uh, each each vine presents its own puzzle when you're going mm. through. Yeah. So, Ooh. and we've got thousands of them. Oh, and thousands of them? <laughs> That's yeah. right. <laughs> so I guess you guys are going to have your hands full for a while. Yeah, uh, yes. <laughs> yeah. How long will it take you to go through and, and prune or, or even go through and harvest? We've got about uh, 25 rows and we are doing about a little over two rows a day. Yeah. Pruning. Just the, just the two of you? Three of us. There's three of us, yeah. Sometimes four. Yeah. The rows are 600 feet long. Wow. There's a vine every five feet or six feet. Yeah. <laughs> so and then uh, it's a lot of vines. <laughs> by next year, we'll have close to 12,000 vines. Yeah. We're planting six, <sighs> six more acres of them. So we'll get you, we'll, like, when, once uh, spring happens and the buds break and they start getting green, we'll take some pictures and we'll show them on the show so you guys can see the place. It's really beautiful. I'd love to see them. Yeah. Yeah. That your, I hand, would. Your, your hand must be really cramped by the time you get all that done. <laughs> it's mostly in the knees because you got to keep, you know, you got to keep like getting down and looking at the vine and trimming. And then you stand up and you go to the next one. And you, you know, it's up and down and up and down. And your knees and your your feet start to hurt. But yeah, yeah, a few years of that, you're gonna blow your knees out. So yeah, and yeah. So we got these cool your carts. age now, Russ. You got to start being, <laughs> but being nice to your knees, right? I I already have to be nice to my back. Now I got to be watching yep. my knees too. Yeah, well, yeah. We we bought some special carts for that. That you they're like you know think of a wagon, but there's a chair on it that's sideways, so you can sit on it and it kind of crabs it along. It goes sideways, and you well, can just face okay. the vines and then, to the next one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're gonna try those out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's it's uh yeah it's hard. We're getting more help too. We're gonna have to have it. Yeah. It's gonna there's gonna be too much for us. The goal is oh, yeah. three thousand cases of wine a year. So yeah. we are, we're right now, last harvest we made, we're going to have enough wine from last harvest to make 300 cases. Okay. So we, we got to up that know, by 10. We got to go up an order of magnitude. An order of magnitude. Yeah. We'll All right. So 3,000, what, where does that what put you in, in compared to other vineyards? Is that small? Is, like, is it still small or is we're it We're tiny, medium? tiny. Yeah. There's, there's quite a few, but there, that's pretty small. I mean, some of these guys are, they're doing, they're making wine for everybody around, and they're also making sixty thousand cases of their own every year. 
Wow. So it's, uh, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's still a, a pretty decent operation doing, yeah. you know, 3000 cases of wine. That's yeah, I can imagine. Yep. So the that's six more we'll acres are going to get you to that. Or yeah. It's got to be bigger than that even. No, that's it. This is the last. Do uh, we have six now? Four. We have we have four, four. now. And we're putting in seven ish. Yeah, so. we're gonna have around twelve ish. Right between eleven and twelve acres. Yeah. So. Total when we're done. So. Well, it's three thousand bottles in a case. Yes. How many? How many? Yeah. yeah. At three thousand cases, it better be good wine. <laughs> it is. It'll be top shelf, buddy. That's right. Only the best. Sweet. Well, I'm I'm looking forward to trying some. Yeah, we're gonna we're, well hopefully we'll be able to bring some to the scablands for you guys to try. So. Oh, good. All right. Yeah. So uh from last year. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We had two barrels last year, which is each barrel's fifty nine gallons. So it was a really small batch. Yeah. It's good stuff though. Fifty five cases we made. So what's the topic today, Randall? Where are we going? Well, we've been following the route of the Bonneville flood along the Snake River, and where we left off was right up there at the junction of the Snake River with the Clearwater, where Lewiston and Clarkston are found. And we looked at Tammany Bar, where we had Bonneville flood sediments being washed north, up a lot, you know, up the Snake River. And then they were met by uh, Missoula flood, I'll call them Cordieran flood, back flood silts that overtopped overtopped the coarser, dark-colored, grayer, bluish, grayer gravels of the Bonneville flood, made a very distinct difference between the two. So, um, you know, I could probably actually just pull up the slide where we left off. And we could have a look, uh, a look-see, and um, I think I'll just do that. All right. And there we go. Now, even to the untrained eye, these is, this is obviously two very distinct types of sediment here, right? Yeah. So below, you have the Bonneville flood, and you remember, the, the currents, the flows coming from the right of this picture are flowing down downhill. They're flowing down gradient, right? The, those coming from the left are actually flowing up gradient. So the course of the Snake River has been reversed, literally, in order to deposit these uh, fine-grained silts, these buff-colored silts, on top of the, the darker, grayer-colored gravels bouldery gravels and then we also pointed out the luss that is on the top up there which is something actually it would be fun to have a devote a maybe not a whole well we could easily devote a whole uh podcast to just the discussion of luss because there's been a lot of interesting studies controversies and mysteries about the luss what what it's what is the origin of the luss and unlike see one of the things to a sedimentologist that they're going to look at with, with this is that, you know, you can see it very plainly here in the uh, Missoula sediments, right? They're horizontal, basically, right? And the, 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 the amount of tilt, the, or in geological terms, the amount of dip of the sedimentary strata is an indication generally of uh, current velocity. So the faster the current is moving, the steeper the dip is going to be of the sediments. And if you look up here in the, uh, in the uh, Missoula flood, back flood, back flood silts, you see how they're much more horizontal, mm -hmm. right? When you look down here at the uh, Bonneville, look at here. I mean, here you can see very clearly the steep dip. I, yeah, I, I've been trying to figure out in my mind. Just imagine the physics. How does it get that? You know, how does the flow determine the tilt of that line, the dip? 
Well, maybe I, maybe okay. I need to look into it. I'm Picture sure these involved. coarse gravels are like bed bed load, right? And and there's mounds of them. Like if you could picture the current ripples, right? Now the shear forces of the flowing water is flow, and it's sediment laden. It's flowing over this mounded area, and basically what's happening is the water is hitting the the uh, stoss side, the upstream side. And as it's moving up, it's dragging material up over the top, and then it's sort of dropping it as it flows down the other side. Okay. You see? Yeah. So it's, it just kind of is repeating this process. And so if you look at this, try to imagine, you can actually see what, where you've got the bedding here, and then it's been truncated. You see it's been truncated right here? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then you've got another suite of four sets, as they're called here, that has then been truncated. Yeah. yeah. So that's basically what's happening is that that in the water, it's it's kinematic, it's pulsed, and these pulses of material tend to form this, this kind of a rippled effect. So somewhere upstream of that is an obstruction that it's pushing over and then dropping? Is well, that this is how I would explain the the, what's called coarsening upward. Typically in normal deposition, it's called fining upward. So if you've got like a, a, a stream that's flowing into a, a lake or a pond, right? What is it? And now the stream is flowing. The faster it's flowing, the more competent it is to entrain and transport sediment. When the flow slows down, which can occur as a result of two things, a shallowing of the gradient or an, uh, a widening of the channel. Either one of those things can cause a slowing down of the current flow. When the current flow begins slowing down, proportional to its velocity is its ability to entrain and transport material. So it starts slowing down. The first thing it does is it will deposit the finest stuff first, except unless it's in suspension. I, I'm sorry, back up, back up. The, the, the coarsest stuff first goes down. The finer stuff successively goes down and then you'll finally have the really fine stuff that's in suspension. But so that's fining upward. So the core stuff is at the bottom. And as you go towards the top of the deposit, it gets progressively finer and finer and finer. And then at the very end, it may be really fine, you know, because the finest uh, sedimentary size is going to be clay, right? That's, and clay can typically be in suspension because it's that fine. So, and then as the water level goes down and you'll get a clay layer, this will be this fining upward. Okay. Now what we have here is an example of the reverse of that. We've got a coarsening upward and the way that I think that that was is typically not in all cases, but I would think it applies to this too, is that somewhere upstream, you have a temporary emblockment. You have a temporary obstruction and the most likely obstruction, it could be a number of things. It's probably, in this case, it's not going to be an ice jam, an iceberg jam like you would have in the Missoula floods, right? Because the Missoula floods are also going to be associated with a tremendous breakup of, of ice masses. So you're going to have a lot of huge icebergs and ice masses being carried along in the waters coming from the north, right? So that can actually cause, just like in... In rivers in a northern climate, during we were talking about earlier during that spring thaw, when the rivers start breaking up, say in the in the in the uh, northern latitudes, this is this is one of the things we used to do as kids that we always we used to like to go out to try to catch like the rivers, the local rivers breaking up because they will literally get to a threshold and within a day or two they will they will break up. It might be a solid, you know, floor of ice. And then with two days later, it's just a, a big old bunch of chunks of broken up river ice that's now being sluggishly moved along. But what happens is if you get into a bend or a constriction or bridge abutments, that's one of the big concerns is during the, the, the breakup of the rivers, if you get uh, ice jams built up on the uh, upcurrent side of the bridge abutments. And then, you know, that can cause problems. So you've got to do something to help prevent that obstruction from taking place. And it's the same concept as a log jam, you know. And if you've got, for example, a wider channel and then the channel narrows and you got all of this stuff being carried and it's all trying to get into the channel, what'll happen? It, it'll temporarily jam up. And then 
what happens when it temporarily jams up is the water level rises it behind it because it, the, the flow is still coming on, right? As the water level's rising up behind it, what's it, what's happening to the pressure? Pressure is going up, right? So at some point, the pressure of the water backing up will be enough to force through the obstruction. Okay, so in the case of the Bonneville flood, what I would speculate is that because of the fact that we've already hypothesized that there's a very strong possibility, probability, that the, uh, the events preceding the Bonneville flood involved lots and lots and lots of rainfall over some period of time, whether it was days or weeks or months or even a, a few years, a period of a lot of rainfall, excessive rainfall. Now, whether it all comes uh, all in one day or two days over several months, it's all a matter of when the ground mass becomes saturated enough that it begins to completely lose its cohesiveness, and then you have a mass wasting event. So, in fact, the original dam that blocked uh, the north end of Lake Bonneville was probably the result of ancient landslides that had, had uh, you know, come down off the mountain slopes, filled the valley bottom, and then had lithified to some degree, but not nearly to the, to the density or, or the degree of induration as the hard granite sill below, right? So it's much more easily erodible. But the idea here is that if, if this is moving along, like think about it, you got you still got to get all of this material and water from the Snake River Plain north through Hell's Canyon. Hell's Canyon is undoubtedly got going to have lots of expansions and constrictions and offsets and things like this. So at the same time that this is happening, if you've got a whole lot of rainfall that's saturating the mountain slopes, it's going to create these instabilities. Now you're going to have landslides, mass wasting events where stuff goes down into the valley, chokes the valley temporarily. Now the water builds up behind it, right? And at some point, the pressure gets great enough that it bursts through, it pushes through, and now it's carrying that coarser stuff with, and it's also moving fast initially because, uh, because of the pressure release. And so now it's entrained larger stuff. That's how I would speculate what we're seeing right here, something like that. Yeah, that's the coarse stuff getting at the top. Right? Yes. So this is called coarsening upward. Hmm. And it's the reverse of what you would normally have. Yeah. Does that it's make still, sense? Yes, it does. It's still amazing to me that just that the, the steep slope of those, you know, what did you call them? The lines? Four sets. Four sets. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm just trying to imagine the water's coming. There's a pulse of water. It's carrying a bunch of stuff. And there's a downslope somewhere in the sediment that's already on the, the floor of the flow. Is that the idea? And it's so yeah. as it's coming up and it's dropping, the water's dropping stuff in it. And, it, and so that, that downslope is moving downstream. Yeah. The, the, yes. It's actually moving downstream. That's right, exactly okay. right. And then that, that begins to peter out a little bit. And then there's another pulse of water carrying more stuff. And it does the same thing again on top of the one before. And now it's moving downstream. And so that's yes. how we see. The, okay. All right. Yeah. Very cool. And and again, you know, here's the thing. You gotta this is not this is not a uniform flow by any means that right. we've got here. Right. You know, it's not like water's flowing smoothly in a pipe. If you look at what's called, you know, uh, uh, laminar flow, you know, it's basically you can almost separate the water into layers and everything's moving along nice and uniformly. That ain't happening here. We got water that's you know, going through all kinds of ups and downs and expansions and contractions and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So what's happening is that there is this, um, you know, much variability in the flow. Okay. Yet even that, you know, there's still going to be a, a, a structure and that's what we're seeing here. Yeah. That's, and, it's so clear. It's amazing that, uh, it's yeah, like vi violent, flow full of all that crap, all that mud and, and soil. And yet it, here it builds this structure that's cle clearly visible. Well, yeah. what It's almost like a frozen snapshot of what you could actually see if you could somehow make the currents visible. Right. If you could, if you could vivisect the current. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that's exactly it. So yeah, that's what we're seeing here. And, and you know, the, the level of differentiation 
also tells you, you know, stuff too, because sometimes you'll here you got very clear four sets, right? Up here, they're not nearly as clear. Right. So, uh, what that's suggesting to me is that the water slowed down in here. Um, you had an event where, see, now you got a picture. If you followed these four sets, they would do this. Follow the, the cursor. This is what they would be doing in cross section. Yeah. So you've got something along here, this change in, in flow regime that's able to shear off the top of this thing and then start a new sequence. That's like you see, that's what you see right here. Okay. The top of this got sheared off and then it started building a new sequence of four sets. Could that be like it's dragging huge material across it? That's, maybe. Yeah. yeah that okay. could maybe. Um, or what'll happen is if if it's if the water is again if 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 you were measuring the current velocity you'd find that there's variability that the, the velocity is constantly going to be changing. So remember, if, let's let's say you've got water with less sediment in it. You know, the water flow depending on its velocity, it has limits as to how much material it can entrain, and once it reaches that limit. It basically isn't going to, it can't carry anymore. It has a maximum amount of, of ability to transport material. So at some point, it will stop doing that. Okay. Now, let's say that you've got an influx of clearer water behind a water, water that's choked with sediment, right? The water that's choked with sediment. It's settling out or it's like right in this place, you know, we saw that it kind of is in this bend in the valley and the water could be slowing down. And then if you're behind it, you have a pulse of water that is not as filled with sediment. And it's, it's, in other words, it's, you get to that threshold. Okay. Here it's, 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 it's now reached its maximum carrying capacity. So it's not picking up any more sediment. It's just moving along what it's got, but it's not really picking up more. Now, if you go below that threshold, now it can start picking up sediment. Okay. Yeah. And if you go way below that threshold, now it can come in and it can just whoosh, just sweep away layers of what's already there. Right. Okay. So it, it will pick up. Yeah. So it could shear off the four sets. Yes. Right, if it's cleaner water. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. It's a whole language. And I have by no means mastered it, but it's, to me, it's so interesting that, um, yeah, it's, and it's fun to learn this kind of stuff. Um, because yeah, that's how the, the story is revealed. I mean, this is one way you decipher it. And there are but, so many lessons there. I mean, it's amazing that you're not able to find more papers about this very specific site. I mean, like you've said, somebody could do a doctoral thesis just in this one spot. Oh yeah. Yeah. And well, you know, some of the, the criticism I got from Bjornstad where I don't, I forget what he said that I had wrong about this. Um, he said that Jim O'Connor in his paper had addressed that, but I think that it had to do with the hiatus between these separations. And, you know, I did read the O'Connor paper years ago and I don't remember exactly what his conclusions were. So I need to reread it, but that was the main question I raised last week or the last episode was how much time elapsed between the deposition of these two sedimentary regimes right here. The question I raised was, well, if there was any um, substantial lapse of time, there should have been a whole, you know, layer of vegetation that had, um, you know, even if, even if it was, uh, you know, and it wasn't at the time, I mean, you can see there's vegetation up here on the top that's growing. Well, the thing is that this is a semi-arid environment now, um, and there's enough. Now, if you were to come here and dump mud on this right up here and entomb this vegetation that's up here and then dump another 50 feet of mud on top of it and the mud all dries out, you come back later and do a core sample, you should see some remnants of this organic layer, this topsoil layer that's up here. Now, if we go back to when this lus was uh, or, or this period here, okay, if there was a, a, a period of time, let's say a decade, 
or a century or two between these, then there would undoubtedly be vegetation growing there. Maybe even trees, you know, because uh, at the time this is going on, this is not a semi-arid environment. In fact, we're even talking about the fact that there would have been a lot of rainfall, right? So unless the rainfall was so erosive that it somehow prevented, uh, you know, the development of a normal biome, because typically here's what's going to happen. You guys have probably seen this yourself. Let's say you have a flood and it destroys everything or it creates a new sandbar or a gravel bar or whatever. I could take you right down to the creek here near where I live that I've been monitoring for, for decades. And like in the aftermath of Hurricane Ivan, there were new new point bars built, right? Now, as long as nothing comes along that is now going to, that is forceful enough to erode those, nature starts recapturing it. And you can come back four or five years later and you've got seedlings of trees growing there, right? So my whole point is, is that I think there are still questions that could be raised about the depth, the, the, the interval of time between the deposition of these two layers here. And that's what I want to know because if, you know, was it centuries? Was it decades? Or was it something very, very close in time? And the other thing is, were there Missoula flood deposits before the Bonneville flood deposits? Because if there were, what is going to happen to those Missoula flood deposits once the Bonneville flood comes through? Well, they're all going to be flushed out. They're gone. They're going to be just completely flushed away by the currents that created this down here. See, any current that's going to be carrying this coarse material here is going to make short work of something this fine. So if you had layers of the Missoula flood sediments, back flood sediments first, then the Bonneville flood sediments come through, they're going to they're gonna either flush it out or, or bury them. So the question is, is there anything, if you were to core down through these, what are you going to find underneath the Bonneville? Is it on bedrock? I don't know. Is there another older sedimentary layer from earlier floods? I don't know. So this is our project for next summer, guys. We need to go out here with a, yeah. With a core driller and. Oh, we can do that. Yeah, sure. we can do that. Mike, could you get on that for us? Get us a core driller, Mike. Uh, and sure. A couple a drill of back, core. A couple of backhoes. Uh, bulldozer. Yeah. And arrange for transportation and. Uh, That's sure. right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and then see, then you got the LUS up on the top. And the thing that's unusual about LUS compared to ordinary sediment is ordinary sediment like this. It's water deposited. I mean, virtually all your sedimentary rocks are, most of them are water deposited, ultimately, right? Sandstones, limestones. Now, lamb's, sandstones, of course, can be wind. Um, but, you know, f let me say this, fluid deposits, right? But you look here and you see horizontality and you look at the lust and you see verticality. You see that? And that's what's unique about lust is it has this in, sort of this cohesive structure where it forms these vertical, you know, this it has this vertical architecture to it. And it's also quite cohesive. You know, it's it can be hard, almost, almost semi-cemented. Um, and so the, the controversy is all along have been there two camps. Well, is it wind that, that deposits the lus or is it water? I think wind generally is the more favored explanation now. My thought is, well, why not both at the same simultaneously? You know, my uh, the thing that I would support, and we, again, we can get into, uh, we should get into a whole podcast about this, is that I think the lust, the the possible, and, and I'm not proclaiming this as of any final conclusion, but from what I've seen with my limited studies of lust, is I think the possibility that actually lust is could be created what you might almost think of as a a, a mud storm. Yeah. You know, in other words, you've got a, a rain, but the rain is literally so choked with fine dust and material that it's coming down as drops of mud. Mm. And since you've got about five or six feet of that, and we know that even six inches of volcanic ash can make turn day into night, 
this must have been a pretty interesting sequence of events that you see displayed right here. And there's no, there's no inference that necessarily the five feet of lust that you see up here was all there was because any lust that's raining down during the floods is going to get just immediately swept up and integrated and incorporated into the floodwaters. And it's only the, the lust that's going to be preserved that you see here is only going to be in the aftermath, the post flood period after that last layer of, of mud up here from the back floods has been deposited. And then the spigots are turned off. There's no more water coming from the North down to Cheney Palouse hitting the snake. And at that point now, this stuff that forms the lust layer is coming out of the atmosphere and begins to deposit. So then the question becomes, what was the duration of the depositional event that created that five feet of lust? Was it years? Was it a day? I think it was probably closer to being a couple of days. Because if it was separated by any hiatus, then you should see bedding in there. I don't think there's any bedding. It looks like it was deposited en masse. So yeah. somewhere subsequent to the deposition of the final top back flood layer, this stuff came down. Five feet of it. So boys, think about that. Some pretty, some pretty serious stuff going on here. Yeah, and, and so, in terms of the, like the, you know, the missing biological stuff between the Bonneville and the Missoula flood stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, wouldn't the Missoula floods have washed it away, or are they just too the the sediments show you that it was too gentle to have done too that, gentle? Really? Okay. Yeah, too gentle. There's no, there's very little shear. I mean, because in this next slide, this is literally just around the bend, uh, this kind of deposit. And here's what you're seeing. When you're looking at this stuff up here, you're seeing current reversal. You're seeing water slow. Look, see this? Here's the water slowing down, almost vertical, even, even with a slight up tilt to it. And here's the water flowing back out. Okay. Yeah, it's going way too slow. It's too gentle. So if there were trees there, they would it would have just washed around them and dro drop. They the they should be them. yeah. There should be a whole layer Standing of, trees. of biological stuff there. Yeah. Okay. That would show up seeds or pollen or leaves. Hell, we got leaves that are fifty million years old that were preserved in uh, low energy depositional environment environments. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Makes so there sense. should be that stuff. So. That's what I was saying. Like Brad just said, yeah, you could do a whole doctoral dissertation on this one outcrop here and the stories it has to tell because now you're you're bringing in that whole Bonneville event. You're bringing in the whole Missoula flood channel scabland event. Then you got the lust to explain. And then, you know, then the fact that, you know, when you start going through some of these deposits, not right here, but in a lot of other places where these floods have been excavated, they find megafaunal remains. So not only trees are getting swept up in these floods. Yeah. So, yeah. And then we, we talked about that. We ended up, I think with this, the rapid form Canyon formation by extreme floods, which is out by you guys. Didn't we, didn't we talk about that? We did. Yeah. The lost, uh, uh, the, um, Canyon Lake Gorge, Canyon Lake Gorge, Canyon yeah. Lake Gorge. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, we got to do a field. I think there's going to be a field trip coming up soon. Yeah, we got to get out there. We're uh, got to get through uh, pruning season, right? Planting season. When, when are you guys freed up? <laughs> it's going to be after the trips. I mean, we're <laughs> going to be pretty much slammed up until the scablands trip. Yeah. Well, I mean, where is how far is it from you guys? It's not over it's an hour to drive, hour, right? Yeah. Yeah. You might be able to sneak away for it one day. Maybe. Maybe. Could happen. <laughs> Could happen. <laughs> okay, well, we'll see. <laughs> but I think that we need to check that out because there's a modern example. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we we, we got to get up there for sure. Yeah. Rookie Let mistake. us proceed on something we'll be getting into here. All right. So you see what we're looking at here, glacier dammed lakes and outburst floods. 
Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So in the spirit of uniformitarianism, one of the things we'll do is we'll circle back and we'll look at some of the examples of modern glacier dammed and outburst floods, also called Yokalaups in the Icelandic terms, uh, that are often being used to compare uh, the floods that created the Channel Scablands. Now, um, but I, even though I don't necessarily think we can extrapolate from modern examples up to what we're about to look at, uh, we can still learn a lot that's going to give us insight. So we'll see here. I'm just going to go to uh, slide sword review. You can see what we'll be, we'll be getting into some of this, looking at modern examples of outburst floods. Because these modern examples, we'll look at a little, we'll get into a little bit of paleohydrology, not anything too serious, but just enough. Um, for example, Q, which is peak discharge, we're looking at right here, is, is pretty simple. And basically, anybody who watches it should be able to go out then in the afterwards and um, walk down to a local creek channel and use the formula and figure out average discharge or peak discharge which is a cool thing to do. You go down, um, uh, so you go to a, to a stream channel after a flood and you look for the typical suite of high water features. And there's usually a whole four or five different things that you can look for from uh, erosional strand lines out along the creek. Uh, look for, um, you know, if the water has gone up out of the channel onto the floodplain, it'll usually leave a layer of sand or even sometimes uh, debris, maybe if it's a lot of leaves or twigs or things floating, you'll be able to see that. So you'll be able to get the high water mark, and then you get what's called the hydraulic radius, um, and you get the, the channel perimeter, and you simply use a, a couple of formulas. You put in a formula, I mean a, a coefficient for the resistance of the channel, which is no big deal, and there's a, simply a table that you can look at because – the greater resistance is the greater potential there is for turbulence in the water. So turbulence dissipates energy. So you, it, it's somewhere the water flow will be uniform and laminar, and then at some point it starts becoming chaotic, and then it crosses a threshold, and, and then you start getting turbulence. But it's a, it's a pretty simple formula to use, and then you, it'll tell you what Q is. Q is the letter that stands for peak discharge in a flood. So or in a river, or whatever. So if I use Q, and I, I mentioned, yeah, we're calculating the Q. I'm not talking about QAnon now. I'm talking about Q, <laughs> that's peak discharge in a flood, okay? Just All so right. we're clear on that. Got it. <laughs> Got it. But yeah, it's pretty interesting stuff. When we And some of these modern examples are, are really interesting. Um, so we're going to look at some of that. So that will really give us a, a helpful framework to going back and thinking about uh, the mega floods that we're going to be looking at in the next couple of episodes. So now right. Brad here is sitting uh, at the south end of almost at the south end of Grand Coulee. And this is not Soap Lake. This is uh, the next lake north. Swan um, Lake. By the ice caves. <laughs> By the ice caves. Mm -hmm. Oh, good help. Ice, ice caves up that, up the road over there. The road. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I know that's right. I don't know. I don't remember the name of that lake. I must Lenore. be getting senile. Lenore Lake. You got a bunch Lenore of Lenore Ice, ice Caves. There. Lenore Lake, of course. Now, you know there's a there's a rock arch up there somewhere. It's on private land. But I find that's very interesting. There's a rock bridge, and that rock bridge or rock art arch was totally accepted as having been created by the Scablands floods. So I've seen very little on the origin of rock arches. But that's another question that we're going to be bringing up and in, in considering is how those rock arches are formed. Uh, it's near here, near lower Grand Yeah, Cooley it's up there. It's it? right up there near Lenore Caves. Oh, okay. Yep. 
thinking there was one over in the uh, Telford tract, also the lower end of the Telford, Telford tract that we couldn't we couldn't what, get into to find. What are the caves? Are they're in oh. the the basalt? They're in the basalt. Basalt, right. yeah. Really? Right. Wow. Yeah. Now let's tell you what I'm going to do. Share screen again. Yeah, there I got the the map up now. Soap Lake. Right here, this is Soap Lake is right at the mouth, right at the mouth of the Coulee, and immediately north is Lenore Lake. Now, let me see. Let me go back, and Brad, you are, let's see. Where are, Where did you go, Brad? Oh, you're down here. Um, I'm okay, that, so. I'm in that map. You are in that map. Could you? Would you go ahead and wave? Oh, no, I have to have Google Earth, or we're not going to see you in the map. I have to pull up Google Earth to see you wave. Okay, so the, look at the ledge behind Brad there. Do you see that flat ledge, Russ? Uh-huh. Yep. Um, of course, you, you're still looking at my map, right? I'm looking at your map, and I can see Brad. And you can see Brad. Okay, yep. well, what I'll do, check. We're see that ledge right there? Mm -hmm. My cursor's over it. Now I'll stop the and share. Brad's, Brad's pointing at it. Okay. Yep, there it is right there. <laughs> Kyle made a pretty good guess. He pointed at the spot on the map that he thought Brad was at, and that was that's pretty much it. Yeah. yeah. But it was based on those uh rolling, you know, the the erosional features at the very top. I was looking at that little dog leg of the road does right there. So hanging valleys up there. Yeah. This right here, yeah. Hanging valleys, yeah. Yeah. Now, generally, hanging valleys in most textbooks are going to be explained as the result of glacial erosion. Yeah. Which, of course, is true. But in this case, it's water, water. flood erosion. Mm. So during rainstorms, each one of these little troughs up here becomes a spigot with water spewing out and a temporary waterfall. Behind me here. How often does that happen? Oh. Is, it, is it arid? Or is there a lot of water? Well, is this semi-arid, fifteen about fifteen inches per year? Okay, so doesn't happen that often. No, but it does happen. Right. Okay. You know, maybe a few times a year. I guess I don't. I don't really know. Enough rain where it turns into waterfalls, but it definitely does. Um. So yeah, that's Lower Grand Coulee, and then uh, we'll go back to. Um, we're also ready for a break here. If you want to do that at any point, and then we can come back and get back into it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, all right. We'll just take another minute on the map, and then we'll okay. take a break. So, so yeah, this is the Lower Grand Coulee, and that's Lenore Lake. And then when you go up here uh, to this area, this the image of me there. I behind me is this whole Waterville plateau up here. Hmm. And that's where you find the uh the bold the big uh boulder park, which is a really interesting phenomenon, which you know, as the next uh couple of episodes as we're exploring the, the Scablands area, we'll look at Boulder Park and we'll speculate about how thousands upon thousands of giant boulders got strewn across the fields. Oh, uh, there we go. Yeah. You see this right here? That's an erratic boulder. And then out behind me here is the Waterville Plateau that was completely submerged under floodwaters. So during the peak of the flood, you see this mountain range in the distance? This would have been the opposite shore of this giant temporary river that was flowing through this picture here. Okay, is it the it's way over way out there over your left way your right shoulder? out there over your right shoulder? No, th th this way. <laughs> yeah, okay, right. Uh, your left okay. shoulder. Yeah, is that your this left right here. Okay, yeah, yeah, I see it. I guess I could just use my cursor, couldn't I? But uh, yeah, no, we, no, I was gonna say if you were, we're not seeing the cursor. Yeah, you, you're gonna have to point oh. with your fingers at the picture because we. Well, can't. that's what I. Yeah, right yeah, there. Okay, there that mountain range. All right. So all of this behind me, and see, I'm up on a ridge, and. This boulder, where did it come from, and how did it get set on that ridge? Is that the one on your other side, the boulder you're talking about? Yes, this, wait a minute, that right boulder there. Okay, right yeah. there. Oh, that the one. edge, yeah. <laughs> All right, yeah. Th there it is, that guy right there. Okay. 
yeah, and look here. here. Okay. What is that? That's a boulder right there. Yep. And look out here behind me. Uh, over here is, it looks like a little bit of the Withrow mooring. Mooring back there. Yeah. Mooring. You okay. see what that mooring means? It means that where I'm sitting, the southernmost extension, the Okanagan lobe of the Cordilleran ice sheet over Western Canada, the southernmost lobe ended right here. So are we looking north in this picture? We are looking east. Okay. Yeah, we're basically looking east. We're up on the ridge in front of me here. There's a steep slope going down almost 2,000 feet to the Columbia River. Ah. So, in fact, if I step forward about three steps, I would just plunge over the All right. precipice. Let's see it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I got to just I got to step careful here, yeah, or I will have to take a break. Then, <laughs> yeah. then we would have to take a break. Yes. <laughs> okay. Well, let's take a break then. All right. We'll be right back. All right, we're back. And uh, before we get back into the material, of course, we wanted to mention CBDfromthegods.com. Uh, Randall, you've got an update on uh, CBD from the Gods over there? Well, as a matter of fact, I do. Um, they've sent me uh, a sample of their flower to try. So um, I'm going to give it a try. Expands. Yeah. So right. it's not intoxicating in any way it's only got zero less than 0 0.3 percent thc so it's totally legal but it still has all of the full spectrum cbd components in it so it's just another way of consuming um so this is the incan incan like the incas princess kush hand trimmed for randall and rowan rowan's my brother of course 100 percent organically grown Hand harvested, two months, slow cured on the stalk, hand trimmed, premium grade CBD hemp flower, less than 0.3% THC. And it has a certificate of authenticity from the, uh, well, let's see here. Excuse me for a second. By the, uh, oh, yeah. It's an authorized distributor of the Blue Moon Ranch. So, yeah, the Blue Moon Ranch. Hey, I think that we need to check that out at some point. Yeah. yeah and so then, that's the, I want to see you read that to some South Georgia deputy sheriff. <laughs> <laughs> no. Who decides to pull you over? <laughs> well, it's in the bag. So he can read that lesson. So it's totally legal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I said, I want to see you convince some South Georgia deputy sheriff of that. Normal guy is not impressed. <laughs> I guess okay, not. well, we'll see. It looks just like the illegal stuff, I think, is the problem. It looks like it, but it doesn't smell like it. And uh, obviously, well, yeah. Son, you're going to sit here in our jail till we test this stuff, and it's going to take two, three weeks. Well... <laughs> Okay, so that could be. So if anybody listening is going through South Georgia, uh, <laughs> take this instead, which is the gummy bears. Ah, oh, there you go. So, yeah, if you're worried about sheriffs in South Georgia, you got the, the new gummy bears. So I haven't tried one yet. This just came in today. Let's see here. What do we got going on? They're like little wedges. Let's take a look inside. Little, little okay, triangles. this is the first. I'm just seeing this for the first time now. <laughs> ah. Hmm. Hey. It's pretty pretty delicious, but I don't know. Let's see what uh, CBD from the God's Gummies. Each container includes an assortment of four. Okay, an assortment of four mouth-watering flavors. Tangerine. Pear, strawberry lemonade, and cherry lime. 
Each gummy weighs a generous six grams and carries approximately 10 milligrams of our very popular Oregon grown full spectrum hemp extract. So I'm going to give this a try. What I'm going to do is I'm going to actually add it to the, to the liquid drops. So I do this before I go to sleep. I think what I'll do is I'll pop one of these for, for dessert after lunch. Uh, save. Take one right now. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Really? See, see how you can feel by the end of the show. Should I? Okay. Hey, look. I'm hey, willing real to take life risks. science, folks. I'm bold. Do science on the show. Yeah. I'm bold. I'm brave. I'm willing to take risks. All right. All right. I think I will take. Here it is. Look at it's kind of cool. But hey, is this uh, modeled after one of the uh, triangular UFOs? <laughs> look. Up in the sky. <laughs> they, they don't make noise. <laughs> oh, they they don't. Okay, okay. Is it any good? How's Silent it taste? lozenges. Strawberry lemonade. What, what flavor was that? I think you had the strawberry lime there. Yeah, I think that's what that is. Mm hmm. Hmm. Excuse me. It's a bit chewy. Well, it, it is a gummy, right? So yeah. there you go. Well, yeah. So uh, it's supposed to be chewy. If you're interested, go to the to the website cbdfromthegods.com. They got a nice mobile site. I checked it out. Um, you can see their products there on the front page. They have descriptions. They also have a uh, an isolate CBD oil, which is a much milder form of the of the Apollo. So go check out their products, cbdfromthegods.com. If you order something, put in the um, promo code RC ships free for free shipping. Uh, it helps the out US. the podcast in the U.S. That's right. Yeah. Not to Mars <laughs> yeah. or the moon. Not free shipping to the moon. That's right. Uh, but yeah, it helps out the podcast. And we thank everybody who has patronized uh, CBD from the gods. Absolutely. Yeah, actually. Hmm. I think that was I think that was the uh, cherry lime. And there's just a little hint of the CBD flavor, which I've actually kind of grown to kind of like. I at first, you know, the CBD flavor it's like anything. But sometimes you taste something the first time, because um, I certainly know, you know, as a kid growing up, oftentimes there were certain foods that I couldn't even stand to put in my mouth, like onions, for example. And I could eat onions every. I do eat onions. I love onions. You're saying it's an acquired taste? Is that what you're saying? It's an acquired about? taste, yeah. Okay. And and I think I've sort of acquired the taste. So, boy, I'm okay. Wow. <laughs> uh oh. Hang on. Hang on. Okay. Three, three steps back from the cliff. That's right. Ooh. Don't yeah, so the there. <laughs> just so people know, right here in front of me, you know, behind me is the Waterville Plateau. But in front of me, right here, it drops down two thousand feet to the Columbia River. So just so everybody appreciates the danger that we put ourselves in to do these podcasts. If I were to suddenly stumble forward, I would I would plummet down the escarpment and be swept away in the Columbia River. And you would confide me out in the Astoria fan out in the Pacific Ocean. But I'm not going to do that because we have to deliver this information. So let's do that. Let's keep Just hope going. the dog doesn't knock the green screen into your back and make you yeah, fall forward. Fly you know, forward. Just tie tie a bungee cord to your feet. There we go. Yeah, because yeah. that could happen. I mean, yeah. the dog could come barreling through here, knock the green screen right into me, and then I fall back, or I get yeah, and I get knocked forward, and <laughs> that's it. That's it. I think you get held up in one of the dams. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't make it to Astoria. Would yeah, that's you. true. I would. I wouldn't make it, would I? Well. What I'm going to do is how many dams are is it? How many dams are there? Oh, Depends on where you start. There, there uh, probably, series. There's probably half a dozen of them from there, yeah. at least. Hmm. One, two, three, four. Yeah, six or seven from there to out into Portland. Wow. Uh, yeah. And all right, so I'm going to I'm going to show you approximately where I am 
sitting. So you can kind of get the picture here. Uh, now can we see the map? Yes. There All right, go. cool. This, you see where the water started spilling over right th through this, this constriction right here. Spilled down in this, you can see it channelized right here, and then it deepened the channel right here as it's making its way down to the Columbia. So this picture was taken uh, somewhere right here up at the top of this, of this area, this ridge right in here. So behind me, you're looking out over all of this. And the mountains you see in the, va in the far distance are these mountains over here. So I'm sitting right in this area. And behind me, you're looking across. Uh, you'd be looking in a direct line from me to those mountains. You know, we'd be hitting the top end of Grand Coulee. So what is that, 50 miles-ish? Uh, let's see. Yeah, you're for a, uh, a scale here. If you go from Grand Coulee up here by the dam. Oh, yeah. That, well, there you go. Yeah. Down to Soap Lake, that's about 52 miles. Okay. So you can use that as a yardstick. So the deposits we were just looking at are right down here. Clarkston in Washington, Lewiston in Idaho. The deposit we were looking at is right in here. Let's see. Yeah, so all of this in here. Let's see the gravel pit. Well, if we go to if we go to the Google Earth, we should be able to see the gravel pit. And I'm going to zoom in. And yes, you see all this in here. That's that's the gravel pit, and where uh, where we that picture was taken. That the particular gravel pit outcrop right at the top, right up, right in here, I believe. The gravel pit's right at the top. Oh, right it's, here, it's yeah. More, it's more light colored gray there. Yeah, yeah, right in here. So I believe this is the outcrop right here. Yeah, pretty yep. sure because remember there was a gravel yep. road that went in next to it. So yeah, that outcrop is this thing right here. Yes. But you guys said it's been changed. They've been digging into it. So it's yeah. the picture you took is no longer there because they just keep digging, digging it yes. back. Yes, yes, yeah. So we'll go back to the map. It has yeah. kind of been fenced off. It's almost like somebody told them to preserve it. Oh, but it, it definitely looks different than the first time we went there. Well, okay. So they put a marker there, Brad, to commemorate our visit. You see that right there? <laughs> the vault toilet. Yeah, that was us. That was us. Yeah. Leaving some copper lights, you guys. <laughs> okay. So that that's on the inside bend. So it's, it's the bar, right? So was, was those yeah. same sediments on the, on the far side? We haven't gotten that close to the river on the other side. So no. yeah, it's not like it's a terrace, but it's just on that inside bar. Correct. Which is pretty much. Yeah. I mean, this is the, it's the inside bends of meanders where you get the gravel bars and the point bars deposited. Yep. So that's exactly right there. That's what I was talking about. The bend, there's a bend in the river right there. So when we go back here, you see this, this is where the Bonneville water flood water was coming all through this Canyon here. So. Yeah. So there's a bar right there too, right? At that bend you just passed. I could see it. Uh, right, yeah, here. right there. Yeah. Looks like it. Yeah. Yep, and, one, and one above that. Well, yeah, and, and just north of there, yeah. Yeah, yeah right and there. And then right here. Yep. So because, think about this, and this 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 comes up in the discussion of understanding the geomorphology, is that when the water is flowing around, it's like all the water molecules, it's kind of like they, uh, they've got this affinity for one another, and they want to stay together. And so what happens is, it's it, think about this, if you're running on a track, and you're in a in a race around a track, you want to stay as close to the inside track as you can get, right? Because if if you're if somebody on the outside of the bend is going to keep up with somebody on the inside of the bend, they actually have to be running faster, don't they? Well, it's the same with the water molecules. Um, 
you know, you're going around the band. So as they're going around the band out here, the water molecules are moving faster than they are on the inside. So that delicate balance between, and, and, and think about this, because the outside band, what it's doing, it's eroding, right? It's creating a cut bank where it's steep. On the inside, even with that differential in the velocity across the, the width of the creek or river or stream, whatever it has to be, you've got on the one side erosional, on the other side depositional. So even that subtle difference in velocity within a single stream flow can be the difference between erosion and deposition. And that's why you will always look at the curve in a creek and and barring differences in, in bedrock lithology or composition, the normal the normal uh, uh, regime is going to be erode the outside, deposit on the inside. And likewise, let's say you're just looking at a straight channel and that water is flowing through there. Well, the water layer that's in contact with the channel uh, perimeter itself is going to be moving the slowest because there's going to be the greatest amount of friction. I mean, my chair up, there's lightning flashing in the sky behind me. I don't know if you guys are picking that up or not. Yeah, yeah we can see I it. guess there's a storm moving in. <laughs> but I'm not hearing the thunder yet, but I'm sure we'll be hearing peals of thunder soon enough. Okay, so you've got your channel. The water's moving through that channel, and the slowest flowing water is the water that's being slowed down by the friction that's generated between the contact of the flowing water and the channel boundary. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now, as you move outwards from there, the velocity of the water is going to increase because obviously the shear forces that generate the friction are greatest on the margins. And then as you get move towards the centers, there's this, there's a zone of maximum acceleration. So the water typically in a cross section of a stream or river, the water, uh, barring the effects of turbulence and, and, and everything else, just in smooth, uh, uniform type flow, the water in the middle is going to be moving faster. And then it falls off in velocity as you move from the middle out to the margins. Make right. sense? Now, it's that is why we get horseshoe cataracts. We'll look at that in a second. So let's go back to the screen share. Okay. So we're going to start. We're going to look at the Cheney Palouse Scabland Tract because this is the easternmost of the Scabland Tracts. And it's the water that carved the Cheney Palouse Scabland Tract that put those uh, back flood silts on top of Tammany Bar, sandwiched between the Bonneville gravels and the Luss, right? That's where that stuff came from. It came from the Cheney Palouse. So a lot of that was actually Luss originally that was deposited over the basalt plateau. So now when we go to the Cheney Palouse, that's this right here, right? So again, as I said last week, what you're seeing here is the dark basalt that's showing through the light-colored lus. And let me move you guys out of the way. So picture this water coming down in this direction from the, uh, the area of Spokane Valley, coming down this way. And there's a rim right here, right? This is a ridge right in here that separates. In other words, right here, if we could draw a line right here where my uh, cursor is, to the north of that, it's sloping to the north. And it slopes down to the Spokane River right here and to the Columbia River right over here. This line right here marks where the change in gradient takes place. So north of this line that I'm kind of roughly defining right here, it slopes to the north. South of that, it, flow, it slopes to the south. So if you can picture water filling up, and then, of course, you have the mountains right up here. So in a sense, what you've got right here is a low-lying region, a trough, if you will. 
Now, if that water fills up that trough, it rises high enough, which I think right in here is about 2,400 feet above sea level. It spills over this divide, and then it flows because from this point south, the basalt plateau tilts to the south. Is, are you following this? So once the water fills up this area to where it reaches that 2,400 feet above sea level uh, uh, alt elevation, what does it do? It starts spilling over, and it flows south. And as it's flowing south, it's sweeping away one to 200 feet of lust topsoil that has accumulated on top of the basalt under underneath, the underlying basalt. The water flows down, and then it hits the Snake River channel right here. Now, when it hits that Snake River channel, what it does is this. It hits the Snake River channel. South of the Snake River, there's, a, there's an upland. There's higher hills. The water hits there, and then it diverts. It bifurcates into two flows. One flow would be the normal flow, which is, again, the Snake River is flowing from right to left here, from east to west. So now this water is flowing to the west here, but there's so much water coming in that it literally reverses the flow of the Snake River. Now, you see this is the Palouse River coming right in here. So I'm going to now stop share, go back to the map, not there, uh, to the map, Randall, to the map. There it is. Okay. Here comes the Cheney Palouse down. So look, up here by Medical Lake, you can see that's that. That's the divide. So north of there, the gradient is dropping. South of there, the, gr the gradient is, is, is dipping or tilting to the north. This line that's coming across here, south of there, the gradient dips to the south. So if this area fills up with water up to the 2,400 feet above sea level, it can spill over the divide here. On the other hand, if the ice has filled this up, it doesn't matter. It's going to be the same thing. The water coming off the ice, and, and I'm sometimes thinking that's what it is. I'm thinking that this actually marks the southern limit of the ice over here, the ice lobe. So if the water is coming directly off the ice lobe, you can actually see as we zoom in, you know, look what's happening. Look what's happening right here. You see now here, you see an erosional channel. Well, this is starting. This is the head of the channel, and it's flowing south. Here, this is flowing north. Or northeast, see? So right in here, if you're standing here, you're kind of at the high the high water mark. I could go into Google Earth and we could get the absolute elevations. But see, here's the Spokane River. So right here, look at this. Okay. Start out. See right here? You've got the beginning of a channel head right here. And then the, the water flows down this way and flows down this way and becomes part of the much greater complex of erosional features. And, and look here, look, look at the luss, how it's been shaped. This is, again, like 200 wow. feet of, of topsoil all in here. And we can see something interesting very here. This is Crab Creek Coulee. And what you see right here, this is water coming down to Cheney Palouse, which was right here. We can go up here and you can see, look, here's the head of this channel. Here's the head of another channel. So right in here, is where the direction changes. And that's important Important to understand here in trying to decipher what happened here. So I'm inclined towards the idea that, that there was ice filling this area. And what we're seeing here is the water discharging off the ice lobe and then hitting the area just south of the ice margin and beginning to erode the luss away. And then it gets down in here. And look at this texture. Look at this. I mean, this is textbook scab land right here. Butte and basin topography. So this is all sculpted by these intense water flows that are pouring over the land from multiple. Look, you got a flow here. You got another flow here. You got a flow here. You got a flow over here. And then up here, all of these are flowing in a different direction, like these channels, they're flowing to the north. And then, but then look here, this is flowing to the south. And then you come over here and here's the Telford. But we're going to follow this Cheney Palouse south. 
And you can see here, I mean, look at this. I mean, here's the, the lust topsoil that's still intact. But look, you can see, I, I, you had a great meltwater stream that came down this way. Tremendous amount of turbulence and frictional forces that it's generating. This rock lake occupies a deep scour trough that was just excavated by the by the turbulent waters rushing through here. Strips away 200 feet of topsoil, and then it goes to work right on the bedrock itself. And then begins plucking and quarrying and gouging out the bedrock. So once all of this is over with, then a lot of these bedrock troughs now have lakes in them. But that was their origin. Their origin of Rock Lake, for example, was profoundly violent event. Um, so we can follow that. And look, look at these features here. This is, this is just totally mind-blowing to me to look at this. Now, initially, you see the, the whole landscape was submerged. So you've got, imagine a sheet of water flowing over the landscape, sculpting and shaping the lus, right? Now, so the lus is bearing the imprint of these these current these huge sheets of water flowing. Well, as it's flowing, the water is then, and we've go, gone over this process how it works. It transitions from a sheet flow to a channelized flow. So it'll find some. There'll be some zone where the water is preferentially focused, and that will get the most erosive. So it'll start eating down through whatever the material, whatever the substrate is, it'll start eating down. And as it does this, it'll begin capturing more and more of the water that's flowing as the sheet until eventually if it gets deep enough, it'll capture the whole flow. And then at that point, the water is now all concentrated, focused into the channel, and it can really begin to do some serious down cutting. But what we're seeing here is the transition from, these, from the first the sheet flood into the channelized flow right here. And look, if we come over here, I mean, look, okay, look at this. Look at these features here. This was pro would have been initially submerged, but then as the as the whole flood sequence proceeds, this would have become an island within this massive raging river of incredible, un almost unimaginable turbulence. And this river, of course, is sweeping every the the, the old pre existing landscape. Boom! It, it doesn't stand a chance. This water is just literally washing it away. And then once it does that, as you can see right here, it just starts eating its way right into the very bedrock. So it's pretty phenomenal. But yeah, I mean, look at this. So you can just trace the pathway of this water. But where's it ultimately going? Coming down here. And then it begins to channelize. Look at here. Here's the beginning of a channel. Look at this perfectly straight. Probably following a fracture in the bedrock. You know, probably what there was a pre existing crack right there that the water was able to exploit. And once it did that, and, and, and we can actually see here, look, if we look down Washtuck Nakuli, you see here, this, this is the Palouse River. The modern Palouse River comes down this way, comes along here. The old channel flowed down here. This was the original channel of the Palouse flowing down this way. You can see, look, right here, a little remnant of it, and it flowed down right in here, and it joined the Columbia down here. When the Cheney Palouse floodwaters came down south of here, the pre existing divide between the Palouse River, which is this, and the Snake River here, it, it, it was completely, this water was oblivious to that because it completely overtopped it, right? So, what happened? The water comes and overtops this whole upland area, the interfluve that separate, separated the channel of the Palouse River from the channel of the S Snake River. And then, like I said, it probably picked out a fractured line in the bedrock, exploited that, cut down this deep channel that is now known as um, Palouse Canyon, and then look what happened. And then we have some deposits here, the Palouse River, 
got deflected out of its original ch original channels, and it was captured by this newly formed, newly emergent De uh, Palouse Canyon right here. And then it comes down, and there's a major falls right here that we're going to soon see a picture of. And that particular falls, this is where James Galuli at Palouse Falls, Palouse Falls State Park had his epiphany where he finally could no longer could no longer explain away Brett's flood hypothesis where he finally had to give in and go yeah okay i see it now he fought tooth and nail but in the end he gave in and that's what a good scientist is supposed to do actually he put, he mounted a great defense but when when he was defeated he conceded with integrity and good sportsmanship yeah, others like Richard Foster that Flint. Story last time. Yeah, so others like Richard Foster Flint, who lost the argument, he didn't. Uh, he didn't. He, he wasn't. He was kind of a sore loser, and only begrudgingly in a couple of his last papers did he sort of halfway admit that, yeah, there was veracity to the mega flood account. But he mostly went to his grave, never fully accepting the catastrophe, the catastrophism that was implicit in all of this. So look at that on the right side of the screen. That was, that was a clone there. There were, there was a bunch of uh, squares that were identical. So they've, they've covered up something right there. Well, Where? Yeah, yeah, I see that. Yeah. I've been it's, noticing that all over the place. Yes. Yeah, like tile. It's a bunch of repeated blocks it, there. It's not just right there though. It's been in. Yeah. There, there you really see it. Yeah. It's been everywhere. Uh -huh. uh, might need to restart. <laughs> Yeah, I was you just think thinking how clear how clear some of these images are. It's a lot more than uh, when I've been perusing. But yeah, then I saw that little artifact. Yeah, and then look at here. We got another major channel coming down here. And then the water comes rushing down here and hits this. And we can see what, what the water did to the opposite side, the south side of the Snake River, cut into it. And float up onto the uplands here, and let's see, carved a series of channels. Oh yeah, I think it overspilled. There was let's see, some spillways into this area, or oh, the Tucannon River, right? The Tucannon River. So the water back flooded up the Tucannon as well. So that would probably be a very interesting traverse to make. And we did, didn't we? Go up the Tucannon a ways. Yeah, we've been there by Starbucks. Yeah, there's some. Uh, yeah, yeah, so, interesting stuff right along the side of the road there, whether they're barbs or yeah, backflow right. sediments. Yeah. So when the water hit here, it split. One flow went to the west, which would be the normal flow of the snake, and we we, we followed its pathway down, and then the other flow backed, reversed the current of the Snake River, and it flowed all the way back up here. All this way, look at here, all this way. And then finally, it settled out in this basin where Lewiston and Clarkston and Tammany Bar is right here. And when we go up into Tammany Creek, right here, that outcrop that I showed you should be right in here. And that's where we can see actually the current reversal taking place. So it shows you, it shows us that Missoula floods came up here, settled somewhere in here, and then right in this area of Hell's Gate State Park, the water reached its limit. And then when so when it first reaches that limit, temporarily you're going to have hydraulic uh, damming downstream. As long as water is continuing to flow down through the Cheney Palouse, this water is going to be backed up. Only when the Cheney Palouse flows have either ceased or declined enough that the water that has backed up the snake can actually flow back out. See? So when we trace this back up, right up here to Spokane Valley, and we can actually keep following that water flow right up through the Spokane Valley right here, 
right up through Rathdrum Prairie, which is where Victor Baker did his paleohydraulic work and concluded that the flow is coming through this area, right in here, Spirit Lake and Athol, uh, Bayview, all of this coming through here may have been as much as 800 million cubic feet per second. About twice the flow of, of the flow that cut Grand Coulee. It's a hell of a lot of water, guys. And where did that water come from? Well, now we get to some of the interesting uh, discussions about the origins of this flood. Now, the conventional view is that all of the water came through the Clark Fork Valley this way. Or has been for a long time. I think even some of the more conventional boys are beginning to admit that there were other sources of water from the north. But for decades, the assumption was all of the water's coming up the Clark Fork here, and that this the valley occupied by Lake Ponderé, and coming down through here, and I'm inclined to think that that possibly right down here in that lobe of ice ended right here. So at this margin, it basically tapers to nothing, right? But as you go up into the ice sheet, it gets thicker and thicker. And of course, the assumption is, is that right here, it has to be half a mile thick, right? Because once you go into Clark Fork by the Cabinet Gorge Dam, which is right in here, ah, there it is, yep, the Cabinet Gorge Dam, is generally where the geologists will kind of roughly place the interface between the ice dam and the lake water. But right there, the lake water, the high water mark is 2,100 feet above the valley floor, right? The valley floor right in here is at about 2,100 feet above sea level. The high water indicators along the channel walls are at 4,200 feet above sea level. So what that means is, is because of the fact that, you know, if uh, the, the ice has to be thicker than the depth of the water because ice is about 92 or 93 percent the density of water so it becomes buoyant right so you had to have to have a minimum of say roughly a half a foot a half a mile of ice right in this area plugging this valley in order to accumulate 2000 a, a head wall 2100 feet deep in the in the in the uh, throughout the Clark Fork Valley and then, of course, the idea is that that water backs all the way up, and then you've got a major reservoir of Missoula Lake water in here, which is now occupied by the Flathead Reservation. It's, it's called the Mission Valley because these are the Mission Mountains here. And then a mu another very large uh, fl uh, uh, water accumulation filled the Bitterroot Valley all the way down here south of Hamilton, probably all the way down here into Connor. Um, and all throughout here, 4,200 feet above sea level is the highest where the water rose at its maximum. Okay. So, uh, so when we look at Cheney Palouse, we're looking at a flow that appears to be coming right from this valley, this trough right here. Right. Now, we're going to get into some of the discussion about the ultimate source of that. But when JT Pardee, the uh, geologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, who's generally credited with the discovery of Lake Missoula, which, you know, is, was this lake filling these valleys all in here. He did a calculation, a peak flow calculation. He calculated Q. Remember Q, peak discharge? He calculated Q right in here at Eddy Narrows, which is this area right in here. He used this, this straight stretch right here where you can get a, a nice cross valley profile with clear high water marks. You've got a gradient. You've got a, a, a Manning's number, which can go in, which is basically the coefficient of roughness, which you throw in. That's all determined through empirical testing. You put in that uh, Manning's number, uh, the coefficient of roughness, which is a measure of how much turbulence, and then you make that adjustment, and then what you end up with is Q. You end up with the peak discharge. So he did that right in here, and he came up with somewhere around 350 to 400,000 cubic feet per second. Cubic, back up, 350 to 400 million cubic feet per second, right? 
just about, okay, so now you have, and this was back in the 1940s when he did that. Now you have the early 1970s, Victor Baker comes through and he does his, it's called the step backwater method. It's a somewhat more accurate way. It's where you take cross sections at multiple places through the channel profile. And then you adjust for changes in, in, in uh, gradient and things like that. So it's a somewhat more, but it's not a whole uh, factor of two more accurate. And what happened was he measured right in here and came up with, like I said, around 800 million cubic, up as much as 800 million cubic feet per second, or roughly double what, what Part E came up with through Eddie Narrows right here. So now that raises to me an interesting question. Was either Victor Baker or J, uh, JT Party off by a factor of two? In other words, if, if Victor Baker was right and all of the water was coming through the Clark Fork Valley, then JT Party was off. He, he had a huge margin of error. He was only calculating half the amount of, of water, right? Or, or, there was a there was a, an augmented source of water contributing to Victor Baker's uh, calculation, and that source of water would have been right here. And there it is. I mean, there's there's an obvious source for it. So that becomes part of the discussion that we're going to have, um, and and it comes down to me the whole question of of sources. Where is the ultimate origin of this water coming from? Because for decades it's been, oh, it's coming from Lake Missoula. Well, if you look at the the, the calculations for for maximum volume of water throughout here, that, that in fact it even even they found evidence that the water at some point for a very short period of time rose up to about four thousand two hundred and fifty feet above sea level. Okay, so depending on where exactly you take that determines the total amount of volume. So the calculations that took in the 4,250 feet per sea level came up with over 600 cubic miles of water. It's a lot of damn water, right? Now, we're going to look at this because when we see the maps, we're going to see that you're talking about almost filling the catchment basin up to its rim to do that. Well, in a catchment basin, you have a ratio between things that are going on, right? The Rainfall that's falling, the amount of water being discharged into uh, into an accumulated reservoir, and then you've got the evaporation because as that water volume grows, its surface area expands. As the surface area expands, there's more evaporation. So typically, what you're going to have is you can look at most modern lakes, particularly you know lots of lakes, natural lakes, or even man-made lakes. You know. What happens in a man-made lake that's held in by a dam if there's heavy rains? They have to let off some of the water. What happens if there's a drought? Well, they don't let any water out, but the, but the lake level drops, doesn't it? Because it's evaporating away. So there's this equilibrium point that, that, that it'll oscillate around above and below and above and below. Well, if you apply that to Lake Missoula, the whole thing is completely skewed because it's like you take the catchment basin and the whole damn catchment basin is almost come filled to the brim, right? So the ratio between the land area where rainfall is, precipitation is falling and it's being fed into the, into the lake is minuscule compared to the lake where it should be the other way around. You look at the Great Lakes or any major lakes and the area of the catchment basin is always way bigger than the, the lake itself. So, see, that to me tells me something. What it tells me there is that Lake Missoula was probably never really a lake in the sense of the word, and we'll get definitely get back into that idea. But, see, the, the thing that I'm getting at over and over again is, okay, well, you can say, okay, Cheney Palouse came down Spokane Valley, right? Well, the Spokane Valley water came out of Clark Fork, and Clark Fork is draining all of these 600 cubic miles of water that filled these mountain valleys of western Montana, right? Well, where did 600 cubic miles of water come from? See, that's what I'm getting at. You can't just kick the can upstream and say, oh, there was this big lake 
without explaining to me the origin of that lake. And, and that water, that massive volume of water has to be coming from somewhere. And what are the, what are the possibilities of where it's coming from? Well, it's either precipitation or, or meltwater. What else is there? And if it's precipitation, it's either rainfall or melting snow. Okay. And if it's also meltwater, that means that the glaciers are melting, right? And there has to be a, a pretty substantial amount of melting to occur in order to produce 600 cubic miles of water. Would that not imply that the glaciers are receding? They're not. And see, here's the idea now. The idea is that this ice dam failed, and then it came back and refilled the lake. And then when the water rose high enough, the dam failed again. It came back and refilled the lake and did this a minimum of 40, maybe as many as 90 times that this cycle repeated. Okay. so. Here's my problem. If you're filling the lake, you got to come up with a source of water. That water is either going to be rainfall, snow melt, or ice melt. Which is it? Or is it a combination? No matter which scenario, which combination of factors you employ and in what ratios, you're still stuck with the same problem. Rainfall? Okay. Well, rainfall, if it's a lot of rainfall, <laughs> or even snow melting, that means you've got a fairly warm climate, right? So now you've got this ice mass that needs to be growing and it needs to be occupying the valley to such a, a, a such an effective extent that it can retain water at pressures greater than 900 pounds per square inch. Now, is that even possible? And to do that over and over and over again? That's where my fundamental question comes in. Now, let's go back to the scab lands here. And, uh, okay, so playing the devil's advocate here, what about uh, solar cycles? You know, we've got this 22-year cycle of the sun. So you have, a, you know, 11 years to the cooling and then 11 years back to the, to the active cycle back down. So you have that periodicity. So in the... In the less active solar cycle, maybe you have the ice regrowing, right? Solidifying in the valley. And then as uh, the sun moves to its more active period, then you have like a lot more rainfall. You're filling the basin, the ice breaches in the active. Okay. Part but zone. in this case, bear in mind the ice, you have to ask at what point would the ice breach? That's where and why I want to circle back and come back to actually looking at modern examples of outburst floods, glacially dammed floods. And you know what you're going to see over and over and over and over and over and over again when you look at dozens of examples of glacially dammed floods, outburst floods? What you see is that the water typically will rise to between 100 and 300 feet depth behind the ice, and the ice completely cannot retain it anymore. And yeah. the ice, the water, gets to that pressure level and it begins to quickly erode either directly through the ice because the ice itself is a, it's a porous medium. Right. You know, it's there, there's a whole network of interstitial cavities all weaving through the ice mass. There are fissures and fractions and moulins that sometimes can be cracks that go from the surface of the ice sheet to the bottom during spring melt. When the surface of the ice melts and the water runs into a mule and into a fracture, they've done, they've, they've used dye tests where you put dye into that water that's flowing into these cracks in the glacier surface. Two weeks later, 30 miles to the south, that colored water is discharging from the snout of the ice sheet. Wow. That's it's moving all the way through the ice sheet and gets to the base of the ice sheet. Hmm. And it'll do that sometimes in a matter of days, sometimes in a matter of weeks. And then when you get the water ponding behind the ice dam, like I said, typically one to 300 feet, and, the, and it gives way. The water will start percolating through. Oftentimes what happens is percolates between the interface between the ice and the channel, right? I mean, it'll, it'll, when the water gets strong enough, like look at the Teton Dam failure, it was actually able to erode itself right through the bedrock. And what, what was yeah. the depth there? A couple of hundred feet? So you're talking about 90 times, 40 or 90 times, you're backing that water up 
whatever, 1,500, 2,000 feet deep behind the ice dam? I don't know. That sounds a little shaky to me. I agree. Yeah. But what, why do they, you know, why do they stand by this? That if, well, if that's the, why, I, that's the question I've been asking for 30 years now. It has been challenged a few places. Um, Warren C. Hunt, the late Warren C. Hunt was the one geologist. And on the eve of our very first uh, traverse in 98, uh, where we did the, uh, which and probably that might've been where that, well, whatever year, I, I got him in several conversations on the phone. He was an engineering geologist, and I'm, and I'm going to pull up some quotes that he wrote back in uh, some obscure journals back in the, uh, in the 70s, I think 77, okay? Basically, what Warren C. Hunt was, he was an engineering geologist. So he would go in, he was a consulting geologist that would be consulted to go in and look at the bedrock suitability for building an ice dam, right? That was his areas of expertise. So he looked at the whole idea of an ice dam and he called it, it's, he said, it's frivolous. He said, there's no way it's not possible. And he cited an example of an ice dam uh, flood that was being explained in Canada that required a water depth of about a thousand feet behind the ice dam. And so he basically started with that and, and said, and, and proved demonstrated the infeasibility of that. And then he said, if that is impossible. Doubling the water depth is even more impossible. But his his critique of the basic model was completely ignored, as if it was never even expressed. Right? Then come 19, uh, I guess it was, when we did our first traverse to British Columbia, uh, when the paper came out by uh, John Shaw and Jerome Lessman, our good friend Jerome Lessman, who's going to be back on the show again, entitled Back to Brett's. Because let's talk now about what Brett's initial idea was. When we go back here to this map, and I think we're still seeing this, right? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So we talked about the Cheney Palouse, how it's coming down this way, back floods up the snake, ultimately flows down the snake and converges back with the Columbia right in here in the Pasco Basin area right here. Okay. But then we come over here to the west and we see the, the Telford. Okay. Same thing. About 2,400 feet above sea level, right? Roughly right in here, we have this directional change. You see these, this, this channel, these channels here are flowing back to depths down as you go north into the Columbia. And here, you have a directional change, so the water is now flowing south. So this is a actual divide, a watershed divide, right? So any water that pools here has to get up to 2,400 feet above sea level. It will then can spill over the divide. Once it does that, it can actually begin eroding divide and cut channels down there, maybe 100, 200, 300 feet deep, right? So now what was spilling over in a sheet, becomes channelized and it focuses along those channels. And that's kind of what we're seeing here. But right here is where that directional change uh, takes place. So we can actually uh, take topographic maps or even, you know, Google Earth. If I switched over to Google Earth, I could show you. We could actually trace the 2,400 feet above sea level divide right in here. What I'm suggesting, and, 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 and it clearly, this is the Spokane River. The Spokane River this whole valley was clearly, the evidence is, all, is conclusive that it did fill up with water up to that level, up to the sill, right? It filled up with water, and then that water spilling over, right, is related to the, the, the carving of these two scab lands. Well, the assumption, though, is in the model of, you know, outburst floods from Glacial Lake Missoula is this. Water's coming out of the Clark Fork. The ice dam has been swept away here. Now, never mind that Lake Ponderay, this trough right in here is 1,100 feet deep, which raises interesting questions in itself. Because in the redamming of the river that supposedly took place, at what point did this 1,100 foot deep trough come into play? 
you know, um, that's kind of the question. So if, if it was there, obviously it would have to be filled with ice first before you could even, let's say it was only 500 feet deep. It means still you got 500 feet of ice and that has to be added to the half mile of ice in order to get the surface of that ice up above the 4,200 foot above sea level. You see what I'm saying? Okay. Now, what if the lake was already there? The ice came out and floated over the lake, which is possible, right? Because you can have ice coming out, an ice load comes out that moves out onto the, uh, the, typically, of course, what happens, whether it's into a fjord or a lake, is at some point the ice will break off and form icebergs, right? And everybody's seen the video clips of big pieces of ice falling off the front edge of an ice sheet, falling into the water and the big splash coming up and all of that, right? Well, if the lake was there, then you would think that that would be happening, wouldn't you? But then how do you form an ice dam? So the lake can't be there, basically. The lake can't be there or the, the ice has to come and push the, the lake out of the way. But then it has to fill a thousand foot trough. So that means that the ice has to actually be 3,500 feet thick. You see? So my question is, is in all the modeling and stuff that I've seen, nobody has ever really addressed the lake and what role that played, right? So now you come down here, the water comes down here. And if we're going to talk about the Telford over here and to the conventional model is this, here's the pathway. So let's say, Russ, you are in a rubber raft and you're being swept along, you're on the the surface of the flood, you're being swept along and the ice dam breaks. All this water flows out here. Somehow you have to get it from here now over to here, right? Well, how are you going to get it there? Well, you got to go along the Spokane River Valley, right? So the assumption is, is that the water to create Telford has to come this way. And instead of diverting south over the Cheney Palouse, which there's only two, it's either there or it's not there. Yeah, somehow I have to avoid going south there at Cheney Palouse to get up yes. to Telford. It has yeah. to get from there over to here and then divert south. Right, which would be a, a lot of work in a raft. That would be a lot of paddling to keep from A lot of south. paddling, a lot yeah. of back paddling and stuff too, yeah. <laughs> so the question is, why did the water go over here instead of just diverting south where it would have already gone. Or if it didn't go here, wouldn't you think that this would be the first place? Because now let's assume this. Let's assume that the ice comes down and is filling the, Spoke, the, the Spokane River Valley. Well, okay, so now you've got water coming down here. It would be diverted to the south. Yeah. Okay, so now it cuts these channels, but to get the water over here to the Telford, the ice has to be gone. Right. So the implication is that you have to cut the Cheney Palouse first. Yeah. Right. Well, if you cut it first, the channel's already there. Right. And it's not going to go further. further why? Past. Yeah. Why is it unless not just going to keep. Unless the, unless the water overwhelms the Cheney Palouse and, and uh, keeps going, west. keeps going west, which doesn't seem possible. Okay. Somehow, so if, there, if, yeah. if the ice was down there, where are the drumlins? Well, yeah, because again, the drumlins, yeah, the well, yeah, and we'll, we'll we'll come back to that actually, because that's an important clue, I think. On the other hand, now let's let's go back the the, the title well, of that two thousand and one paper back to Brett's, because <laughs> what was 99. Brett's initial impression? Not that the Telford came from here, but that it came from here. Uh, okay. Now look I at can, that. I can There's I the, can go with that. Yeah. 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 Here you have a major valley that would have been filled with a thick bed of ice. And if you have meltwater, because look, we, we know that there was ice in here. It's left the call. It's calling cards all up in here. It would have been thick ice, thousands of feet thick, right? It's gone, right? It's not there anymore. It had to have melted. Well, it didn't melt and then evaporate. It didn't melt and flow back to the north. It flowed to the south. Yeah. Okay, now we come further to the west, and here's Grand Coulee. 
Now, according to the conventional model, we have to get the water from Clark Fork Valley down through the Rathdrum Prairie, through the Spokane Valley, following over here. We have to bypass not only the Cheney Palouse, but the Telford. Then we have to get over here and, and cut the start coolies. cutting the Grand Coulee. Okay. And interestingly, right here, the, the Great Notch right here is about this area from this over here is about 2,400 feet above sea level. See? That's a good mystery to leave for next time. How yeah. did the water get all the way over there? <laughs> How did the water get all the way over there? Well, yeah, so this is where we're going to pick it up. Absolutely, because we're, we're, right. we're looking at this whole phenomena. Um, yeah, we're running long here, and it's late, and we still want to talk about our uh, little news we've got to pass on. That's right. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so Brad and I have been working, uh, well, all of us, the whole team, but uh, Brad and I have been working on the getting everything up on HowTube, which is the video uh, and commerce platform that we've been working with. Uh, we've been kind of partnering up with. There, we're a, uh, Cosmographia and Randall Carlson's material in general is, is a flagship of their entire new site. Uh, it's a beautiful site. It's very well put together. Brad and I have been working with them on getting all of our material up on the site there. Right, uh, all 60 been, episodes are, are yep. now on our the Randall Carlson HowTube channel. That's a major accomplishment. So they can be watched there. They can be listened to, to there. Uh, we're going to have lots of options coming up, but I think you guys are uh, going to review some of it. I'll let you go ahead. Yeah. Well, the plan is to handpick a special group of about 100 uh, flagship content creators, you know, over – the next few months, maybe up to a year. Um, it's going to be by invitation only. Everybody that comes on board is going to be vetted for the quality of, of their content that they're creating. And initially, some of the folks that now are coming on board is are doing some great things. Uh, Mark with After School um, is going to be joining the family, the HowTube family. And Ben Davidson. This, Ben Davidson, yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, Two Seals and a Walrus, which are doing incredible work with consciousness-changing uh, plants and things. Uh, we maybe even get Brian Morescu, who's interested, uh, the author of The Immortality Key. Uh, and this is only the first wave of the official how-tubers. As and Mike has are, said, yeah, those, go ahead. Those are the pro accounts. But the free accounts are now open. You can get on HowTube and sign up. That's right. You can become a member and view videos, though the Randall collection is the, the first one there as the flagship. So you can sign up, create an account, you know, put in your email address, and it's, it's pretty simple. Uh, and there's all kinds of features, and uh, we'll be talking about those more as we move forward. Uh, but yeah, you can get there now and start an account and upload your own videos if you want to play with it. Uh, but the pro commercial accounts are going to be the ones that are uh, offering the products and using the e-commerce that's so unique and special to how to. Uh, I'll just tell you for you uh, video listeners out there. You can push play on a video and turn your phone screen off. Yeah, with HowTube. And it keeps playing. It will keep playing. Unlike YouTube. Unlike YouTube. <laughs> Which mm -hmm. stops the play. Yeah, and I think you get uh, a free account gets 25 gigabytes of storage. So, Correct. Uh, you yeah, know, that's not, a, that's not a whole lot for videos, but it's, it's enough for you to put yeah. some con content up there. And also they do, uh, even with free accounts, they allow password protected. Right. videos which is really useful so if you uh if you are a content creator and you're trying to you know give like patreon access to stuff how tube's a good platform to put up password password protected content for your patreon supporters yeah four terabytes uh -huh. of video hosting they do you know credit card processing through stripe what else they've got it's part of what makes them unique is the uh custom e-commerce software that they've employed yeah um the shipping, they use uh, GoShippo.com. Um, yeah, so the idea like uh, Woo yeah, products. They've, integra they've, yeah. they've integrated a whole bunch of very interesting uh, pieces of, of 
commerce software into the website that and it's very well it's very seamlessly put together um yeah you can integrate uh youtube and Vi vimeo videos onto your channel yeah you can you embed them it. yep um yeah, it's very clean looking, very easy to use. Uh, and just unlike, excited about, about getting yeah. it started here. And uh, yeah. we've got all kinds of different uh, areas of content we're going to be continuing to produce. Uh, a lot of stuff we're doing in the background here that are about to be launched exclusively on HowTube. And it's a 92-10 split. So they only take 10% of the commerce. And they've just streamlined the whole ability to conduct commerce yeah. through the internet. Um, so yeah, it's, we're excited about it. Um, it just, it's just launched within the last couple of days. And like I said to Mike, the CEO the other day, this is like a slimy little infant that's out there now. And we got to raise this baby up to a strong strapping adult over yeah. the next year or two. And, um, if you're a content creator and you like the, the 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 potential here, you know, get in contact and through us. I mean, you can get in through us and we'll we'll put you in, or you can go to the HowTube homepage and uh, learn more. And like uh, Mike says, uh, he said it here. Uh, let's see. Yes, the group of the hundred content creators will be chosen for their ability to create unique quality content on a consistent basis. They will be provided with complete access to all how to features and receive our platinum level support services free for a year. And then further, a diverse group of 12 content creators will be chosen from the group of hundred and featured on the how to home, how to homepage as prime examples of how the how to platform works in all its glory. We are calling these HowTube's top 12 flagship channels. And Randall Carlson is the first of these top 12. So you're this team right here, we're, we're the first. So hopefully in a few years, we will be part of a whole growing worldwide network of really awesome content creators who are doing cutting edge things that literally will have the potential to change the world. Excellent. More of that. Well said. Yes, sir. Do we want to do a share screen or anything? Uh, we can do something different or go into more detail here. Of the, uh, of the HowTube homepage? HowTube.com homepage and then the Randall Carlson channel. Yeah, can you can you the, the brother's pull, serpent? Is that something pull, you guys could pull up? Yeah, I'll pull that up. Where did I just open? Okay. So this is the main uh, how-to page. I'm not logged in. Uh, but yeah, so you can see that uh, Cosmographia is a flag flagship. So Randall's lovely face is right there on the front. Uh, and if we, go to, well, if we go to Randall's channel, we do have all the content up here now. So if you do, if you sign up, you'll be able to come in here and you'll be able to comment and uh, follow the channel. You'll get notifications. Um, uh, there's a there's a built-in email system within the HowTube site too, so you can communicate with other people and content creators using that. Uh, but yeah, all of our shows are here, plus other content. Uh, Did we do uh, all that? Yeah, <laughs> Brad and I've been Brad and I've been working hard on this. I know. And uh, look, at of course, that. we've all been working hard on making all these shows. There's a lot of material here. And you know we're just getting started, aren't we? That's right. Yeah, and also started. all of these, all, we're we're using the HowTube how platform to embed the video podcast now on RandallCarlson.com as well because HowTube embeds well, and of course we're, you know, the the, the website integrates with HowTube very well. So we're we're using the HowTube platform to embed the videos on RandallCarlson.com uh, instead go of ahead, YouTube. Go ahead and click on one of those. Show okay. them where it goes. The video will have its own page. Yep. So this is episode 60. 
But yeah, it has its own page. There's the show notes. That's where you get into the descriptions and the, all the extra links and stuff we add in there. Yeah. And we'll be able to add more stuff. Uh, you know, we've been, this, we've been working hard to get all this material up here, but uh, there will be more things that we can put in here. Try another one. Uh, yeah, here we see go. See if the products are in there. There we go. So you can also, it makes it super simple for you to yep. get some of our gear. Yep, here's the hat that I'm wearing. The Cosmographia Cosmo Cap. <laughs> T-shirts. The Cosmo Cap. I like it. Yeah, Cosmo Cap. So yeah, it's a it's a really good site. Yeah, and wait till people see the 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 uh, ray, the polyhedra, the platonic polyhedra that we're creating. Yeah, these yeah they're yeah we're going to be putting more stuff out on that, and also mention that we're just now launching. Now that we've gotten to this stage, we can move into the next phase. And one of the things we're doing is the initial work on developing the state of the art sacred geometry course which I attempted to do a number of years ago, but for a number of reasons, it didn't quite work out. Um, but yeah, look at there. Look at this. These are some of the models that we're creating as Beautiful. teaching. Beautiful. Look at that. Wow. Yeah. They're gorgeous. Nice. Gorgeous polyhedra. I got to get a set of these. Just as a side note there, the site that is selling those previous classes is... Uh... <laughs> what? I don't even want to get too deep into it. So upsetting, but uh, we prefer you wait for the new uh, version and get it directly from RandallCarlson.com. That's yeah. right. Yeah. Which site is that? Any anything that's available there is not benefiting Randall at all. Yeah, I, I get no compensation from any sales of anything from that site. So, what site? Uh, that would be the Sacred Geometry International site. Right. SGI is not SGI. affiliated with Randall at all at this point. That's right. So, HowTube has been launched. Sign up, check it out, poke around, and uh, let them and let us know what you think about it. And uh, we will be using them from now on to host our videos. And this is where we're, we're, we're moving the majority of our uh, video platform over to this site. So, uh, and we're the full episodes will, yeah. will be a home on how to, and, and again, you don't have to join up. Uh, you can watch them directly on randallcarlson.com. Yep. I download the audio there, listen to the audio there. Uh, we're trying to make it as user-friendly as possible. Uh, That's lots, right. of, lots of good things and changes coming soon. We continue. This has been a big project to work toward here for March 1st. And, uh, uh, now it's now it's more content and uh, we made it. Be, it's going to be fun. Barely it's be fun. And yeah, we're really looking forward because I tell you, one of the things that that's really the greatest joy for me of what we're doing here is a number of people that we're connecting with that are just doing amazing things and doing incredible research. And hopefully as the year goes on, we will have some very interesting guests dropping in to converse with us about various things, ideas. And we will also be expanding uh, the, the our, our subject matter. We won't always be talking about destructions and catastrophes and apocalyptic events because um, there's the other side of the equation. We definitely want to get into that. All right. Yeah. yeah we well, thanks very much, guys. Great show. Yep. Great as always. Appreciate yep. it. Looking forward to next week. Me too. And so is it's Todd tough. the Cat. I can tell. Yeah. Todd the Cat, yes. <laughs> he came in, announced his presence, and went back out. <laughs> That's right. He says, if you're not going to pay attention to me, I'm out of here. <laughs> yeah. Isn't that podcast over yet? <laughs> I thought you were done by now. <laughs> thanks again to the Patreon supporters, people that are yep. buying things from CBD from the gods, yep. uh, people that are willing to jump over to HowTube with us. Uh, we really appreciate the listeners and uh, we're going to keep growing from here. And we got more Q and a coming for the patrons. All right. More Q and on for the patrons. <laughs> uh, please, please. <laughs> Q. Thanks Q everybody. A. A. Q and Questions a. and answers. <laughs> Randall has oh. no link to the other. I have Q never promoted. Let's for the record. I have never promoted Q and on. 
That's right. Although certain things that happened within the last year might lead people to believe that I'm somehow promoting, but it's an illusion. It's not true. So that's right. All right. So it will be an ongoing joke from now on. All right. Thanks, everybody. Good Good night. Good night. Good night.